Hello, and welcome to Virtual Coast Fest 2020. I am Kaylin McKinnon, an 11th grader at Glen Academy. Here in our studio today, I am joined by Jordan and Mrs. McKinnon, aka Jan, at to and today we're exploring living shorelines. Thank you, Kaylin. I'm Jordan Dodson, a biologist with the Coastal Resources Division, and I've been in this position for two years. Part of my job is to help promote living shorelines in coastal Georgia. And I'm Jan, a program manager with Coastal Resources Division, and I've been with the department for 20 years. I work with Jordan on living shorelines, and we like to show you a short video about what we do every day for DNR. We'll be back to answer your questions via YouTube and Facebook afterwards. Georgia is home to more than 368,000 acres of protected marshlands. These marshes provide habitat for a variety of species from shrimp to egrets to terrapins. The marshes also protect people and property from the effects of damaging storms like hurricanes and nor'easters. When these storms pass through Georgia coast, they can alter shorelines, sometimes causing erosion. Erosion caused by strong currents and battering waves can lead to changes in the shape of shorelines. These changes may result in the loss of upland concerning property owners. In the past, people have used a variety of man-made structures to protect against erosion. Structures like bulkheads and rock revetments, also known as riffraff, have been placed in erosional areas to prevent property damage. But since 2006, some locations in Georgia have chosen a new, more environmentally friendly way to prevent erosion called living shorelines. Living shorelines provide an alternative to conventional armored shores like bulkheads and riffraff. They use bioengineering combined with native vegetation to stabilize or enhance wetland habitats. These nature-based structures are constructed by the placement of bag oyster shell along the shoreline and by planting native plants in the intertidal and supertidal zone. Mesh netting and lining secures oyster bags to the bank. Because they mimic natural shorelines, they also provide upland and aquatic habitat for estuarine life, including the eastern oyster, which is a keystone species to the marshland ecosystem. The habitat provided by living shorelines is an important feeding and nursery habitat for fish, including the state saltwater game fish through a drum. Living shorelines can also trap and retain land runoff. Native plants are a part of living shoreline construction. It is important to include buffer plants that filter runoff from the upland so that fertilizers do not enter the water and runoff does not increase turbidity. Once these living shorelines are established, other live oysters found naturally in the ecosystem will attach to them and grow, further protecting the shoreline and supporting other marine life like shrimp, blue crab, and flounder. You may think that living shorelines might be more expensive than traditional erosion control methods, but in fact, they're equal to or less expensive than the cost of bulkheads and riffraff. With changes to our landscape caused by sea level rise, more and more coastal residents are opting for living shorelines to protect their property and provide essential habitat for marsh species. To learn more about living shorelines, please visit www.coastalgadnr.org. All right, and welcome back to the Coast Fest studio. Jordan and Jan are ready to take any questions you may have about their program. To ask a question, use the live chat feature on YouTube Live or comment on our live Facebook feed. To use the YouTube Live chat, you'll need to sign in as a user and set up your YouTube channel. You can find directions at www.coastfest, or no, excuse me, www.coastalgadnr.org slash coastfest. While we wait on questions to come in, I'm going to go ahead and start, get started with a few of my own. What are the mesh nets made of, and are they biodegradable? I have an example right here of a tiny bag that is representative of what we use to bag oyster shells. So typically what we do is take this plastic um, which comes on a long um, on a spool and roll it out and cut it to about 36 inches. Um, it is made of a polyethylene material which is a synthetic plastic. Um, we then stuff the bags full of shell and tie knots at the end. Um, these are not biodegradable, important to point out, um, but the department is working um, to, to use materials that are biodegradable that are just now being produced. So we're going to look at testing some of this material in the near future to see how well it holds up in coastal Georgia. All right. 
How long does it take for oysters to establish themselves on a living shoreline? Ooh, that's a fun question. So if you can imagine, you a little baby oyster lover in the water, and you're just looking for a good home, and you see a living shoreline that has oyster bags on it, and you're like, ooh, there's a good spot. And you attach to that oyster shell, and then you become a spat. And that spat takes one to three years to become an adult oyster, and that when you have a lot of adult oysters, that's really when the living shrine becomes mature and really securely stabilizes that bank. Oh. And fun fact, oh, if yeah. I can add, Jordan, that oysters are attracted to calcium carbonate material. So when an oyster larvae in the water sees or senses uh, another oyster shell um, along the bank, then they are uh, more inclined to attach to that material. So it's really important to put this natural material back into the waters to recruit new oysters to a, a shoreline. All right, fantastic answers. Where do you get the plants from? Ooh, you can get the plants from, I would say, any, any coastal nursery. And a lot of those nurseries, they'll either grow the plants from seed or they'll actually go into the salt marsh and take a little sample of that plant that they're using and take that back to their nursery and propagate the plants that way. And those plants are typically the ones that were started originally in the marsh. Those are more resilient during the transplantation from the nursery back to the living shoreline and those tend to be a little bit more resilient and a little bit more vibrant. They, they, do, they do a little bit better. All right. What is the most common buffer plant? Ooh. You want to take that, Jordan? Oh, I can, I can start it off. So we, with the, there's many plants incorporated into a living shrine. And the living shrine, you got to think of it, it's got different sections. So you've got a part of it that's in the water, in the intertidal area that's getting submerged at once a day. And then you've got that zone that's above the water. And the plants that are in the intertidal zone are typically smooth cord grass, Spartina alterniflora. And then when you get out of that tidal range, you want to look into um, also salt tolerant plants, but um, sea oxide daisy, which is the scientific name is Berkia frutescens, is a common plant on that upper portion of the living shrine along with muley grass, which I believe is one of your favorites, right? Muley grass is a favorite and I bet a lot of you out there have seen muley grass before because it has beautiful purplish flowers in the fall. It's a very uh, attractive plant and it's native to this area and it stabilizes that transition zone very well. Awesome. Well, it looks like we have a question. Pat Klein has asked, where do you get your oyster shells from? So that's a really good question. It depends. So we have an oyster recycling program here with DNR. And for our smaller projects, we can use that shell. But for the bigger projects like living shrines that use a lot of shell, we have to go to different sources. And Jane, you want to talk about those sources? We oftentimes will purchase large amounts of oyster shell from, um, from canneries or from shucking houses, um, processing plants basically where oysters are landed and then the meat is extracted for consumption and the shells are discarded, if you will, into a pile that's used for restoration projects um, oftentimes. So we have purchased shell before from Gulf states. We have purchased from the East Coast up in the Carolinas. And so it's a variety of locations um, and it's very opportunistic in terms of where shell is available in the quantities that we need. All right. Can you eventually harvest oysters from an established living shoreline? Ooh, I wish you could. No matter how tasty these oysters look on the living shrines, you should not harvest them. And the reason for that is because there are authorized public picking areas where you can get oysters if you would like to harvest them. But those areas are approved is because we have water quality testing in those areas, testing if there's any harmful bacteria in the water, but we also test the oyster itself um, because oysters, they're filter feeders, so they're filtering anything that's bad or good in the water. And so you really don't want to eat that because you could get sick. And living shrines aren't part of that sampled area. And yeah, approved harvest areas are intended to be remote locations where oysters are harvested and living shorelines are opposite. They are typically built in developed areas where um, property owners have erosion 
uh, affecting their shorelines and therefore want to um, create a bank stabilization project. Ooh, we've got another question, you guys. Megan, Angelina, how do you bag the shells? Ooh. It depends on the size of your project and who's bagging the shells, but um, great question, Megan. We um, oftentimes put in a process, a put, put a process in place to have an assembly line, if you will. Mm -hmm. If it's a big project and we're trying to bag 10,000 bags, for example, um, we will use the bagging machine that we have here at our department to be able to have a conveyor belt system where shells are brought down and again put into this mesh, um, this mesh bagging material. And so it is an assembly line where people are loading shell into, onto the bagging machine and then as it comes out and fills up in the bagging material then these knots are being tied and then it's being stacked and then it's transported to the Living Shoreline site. So it's certainly a process. All right. What coastal county has the most Living Shoreline? Ooh. So, how, how what was the question again? <laughs> I'm sorry. What coastal county has the most Living Shoreline? Has the most Living Shorelines. So I would say Glen County has the most Living Shorelines with McIntosh County as a close runner up. Glen County has two living shrines on Little St. Simons and then one on St. Simons at Cannons Point Preserve. And those are both very beautiful living shrines. And they've been great partners with Little St. Simons, but also the St. Simons Land Trust, which is the Cannons Point Project. And um, those have been great partners, but all, other partners have also been Coastal Wildscapes, the Nature Conservancy, and also the Sapelo Island National Research Reserve have been great partners in a lot of our projects here. Can I add a Living Shoreline fun fact trivia question? What is the one project in Georgia that has removed an existing bank stabilization Ooh. project and installed the Living Shoreline? And that is da -da -da. Little St. Simons Island where a wooden bulkhead was removed and a living shoreline installed and is one of our um, success stories of living shorelines and a great partnership effort um, with the owners of Little St. Simons Island and others of the Nature Conservancy as well. And so this is a very unique project in coastal Georgia because of um, not only the removal of the bulkhead that you can see in this photograph, but also the installation of the living shoreline, which includes these uh, buffer plants, which help to control stormwater runoff um, from the upland, but also help to anchor that bank in place. Okay. Awesome, that's a great fun fact, Jan. So we have another question from Caitlin Ball. Why would you use a living shoreline over a bulkhead? So a, a lot of it's, you know, personal preference. We um, there's other options out there. You've got bulk heads, you've got riprap, and then you have living shrines. And it, it just depends on really what you, what you want to do. Living shrines are more of a nature-based and natural approach. Um, bulk head, if you were to install a bulk head, if you think about it, you're just putting a hard structure there, and you're losing that edge habitat where an oyster reef could um, grow, or you could have some plants and vegetation, which are also great natural buffers. And um, so it's really just dependent on yourself, but we personally prefer living shrines. Jan, do you have anything to add to that one? I think there's also an economic component to that mm -hmm. question as well. And it's a, a really good one and um, one that we work with property owners on to understand the benefits of living shorelines. So there are the ecological benefits that Jordan's talked about. Um, there are also economic benefits, mm -hmm. in, and I think Jordan mentioned this earlier, that living shorelines are equally or less expensive than uh, the, the structures that are typically used for bank stabilization in Georgia. So those different types of bulkheads, but also sloping revetment structures, which are oftentimes made of rock, um, large rock, um, to construct those. So call us with questions about that, too. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> so we got another question from TJ Thompson. Do fish eat oysters? Well, you know, humans love to eat oysters, or some of us do. 
but fish do as well. And one of the, a bit, good example of a fish that eats oyster is the sheep's head. And it's also a very interesting one. We don't have a picture of it here for you guys today, but we'll Google it. Google a sheep's head and a sheep's head mouth because it actually has little almost human-like teeth that it uses to kind of get into that oyster shell and get the oyster meat out of it. And that's one example that comes to mind. Jan, do you know of any others? Well, so fish do eat oysters, but also think about the three-dimensional reef structure that oysters create. And so a lot of things live within that reef system mm -hmm. and fish will depend on those organisms to eat as well, whether they're crabs or they are um, different types of snails, other invertebrates. Um, they're very popular. As a matter of fact, um, they are known as a keystone species for Georgia, and they're also um, ecosystem engineers because of the way that they do create these um, pretty magnificent structures naturally. Mm -hmm. Great right. point, great point. All right. Can any other material besides oyster shells be used in living shorelines? Ooh, yes. So. For a living shrine, you got to remember there's a lot of different components. There's more than one material. You've got your oyster bags, and then beneath that, you've got your geotextile fabric that helps kind of secure that existing sediment to the bank. And you can place oyster bags on top of that, but if you were to use another uh, material instead of oysters, you would want it to be one approved by the department, but you would also want it to primarily be able to recruit the little baby oysters that are floating in the water. You want that spat to say, hey, I want to use that material as my forever home. So it's really dependent. And we're, we're looking for other alternative materials beside oyster shells. Because as we said, we've actually had to outsource for shell. So if any of y'all know of any materials, hit us up. Right. I believe that's all the questions that I have. All right. And that's all the time we have for this session of Virtual Coast Fest. We hope you've enjoyed learning about the Coastal Resources Division's mission. Make sure to tune in next time.